Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Tracking Neural Network Activity in the B27 Plus Neuronal Culture System with a Maestro Pro MEA platform. Presented by Dr. Daniel Millard, Manager in Applications Development at Axion Biosystems. I'm Susie Valdez, and I'll be your moderator for this educational webinar, presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be conducting some polls during the presentation and would appreciate your participation. The polls will pop up in your slide window. In fact, please join me in our first poll of the day. How often do you perform neural assays in vitro? Go ahead now and click on the answer that best reflects your work. Thanks again for participating. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in this slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Daniel Millard. Dr. Millard received his PhD in biomedical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and specialized in neural engineering. At Axion Biosystems, his team identifies, develops, and implements advanced applications for the Maestro Pro and Maestro Edge multi-well microelectrode array platforms. Their goal is to establish and refine electrophysiological assays that are scientifically rigorous, yet also accessible and scalable. By modeling complex human systems in vitro, such as a seizure or arrhythmia in a dish, they help content experts answer questions in drug discovery, safety toxicology, genetics, or disease. Dr. Miller also serves a leadership role on the CIPA Myocyte core team and is a co-chair of the HESI New Talks initiative aimed at improving in vitro neural assays for evaluating seizurogenic risk. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Millard. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. As Susie just mentioned, I am Daniel Millard, the Manager for Applications Development at Axion Biosystems. And today I'll be discussing the maturation of neural network activity in the B27 Plus neuronal culture system as measured with the Maestro Pro MEA platform. I'll start by describing a few trends in biotechnology over the last 10 years. The first is the reestablishment of phenotypic screening techniques, which has shown success for identifying new first-in-class drugs. An emerging application in phenotypic screening is the development of disease in addition models, whereby human disease phenotypes are recapitulated using in vitro constructs via genetic or other manipulations. Disease in addition models are further facilitated by the next trend, which is the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cell technology, a method through which human biology, such as cardiomyocytes or neural networks, can be readily inter interrogated in vitro. Finally, industry trends have emphasized the development of in vitro methods for the evaluation of drug safety, in the case of CIPA and JIXA, or environmental toxicology, in the case of TOX21 and REACH. Each of these trends supports the need to model uh, complex human systems in vitro. And there are a number of obvious advantages to consider for in vitro assays. Compared to systems level animal studies, in vitro assays are generally much simpler and more cost effective. However, in vitro neural assays can exist along a broad spectrum of complexity and thus may not be su suitable to answer all questions if, for instance, isolated neurons are used in vitro. In vitro neural network assays bridge the gap between single cell neuron assays and animal studies, where many neurons of multiple cell types form functional synaptic connections, allowing the in vitro networks to reproduce aspects of higher order neural circuit function. 
At the same time, neural network assays can be performed in a multi-well plate to reduce cost and enable higher throughputs. For example, in a single plate, a number of treatment conditions can be tested simultaneously. For applications in drug safety and toxicology, stem cell development and optimization, and the generation of disease and addition models. For each application, multiple conditions can be tested per plate, allowing scientists to move faster from questions to answers, whether it's compounds, reagents, or genotypes that be, need to be optimized in the experiment. Key biological variables of interest for in vitro assays have a direct effect on the downstream function of the cellular network. For electroactive cells like uh, neurons, the network electrophysiology defines function. Therefore, it is critically important to measure electrical activity from multiple locations within a functionally connected cellular network. Microelectric array technology does exactly this by providing a direct measure of function for electroactive cells. In a multi-well microelectrode array assay, there are multiple microelectrodes embedded into the substrate of each well, illustrated here by the orange circles. As neurons are deposited into each well, they settle to the bottom and attach to the surface. And after many days in culture, the neurons slowly extend axons and develop synaptic connections to form a functional network. By sampling the electrical activity from neighboring neurons, the signals collected from each electrode together provide information on the network activity, thus providing a functional electrophysiology readout. Aside from the cells and the recording technology, the final critical component to an in vitro neurophysiology assay is the culture medium. Neural cultures typically require 21 to 28 days to form a functional network in vitro, and thus the culture media must provide a nourishing environment during that time frame. In particular, the media must support long-term cell viability to keep the cells alive and attached to the substrate, and must enable electrical activity with the right ionic balances. Together, the viability and excitability afforded by the media environment drives the formation of synaptic connections and the network activity phenotype. Scientists from Thermo Fisher have demonstrated enhanced cell viability for rodent cortical neurons in their initial characterization of the B27 plus neuronal culture system. This presentation will assess the resulting network activity that follows these improvements to structural integrity of the in vitro cell culture. To do so, we evaluated three key features of network activity that can be derived from analysis of electrophysiologic spiking activity. First, are the neurons even functionally active? We can answer this question by quantifying the rate of spontaneous action potentials detected across the microelectrode array. This value is termed the mean firing rate. Using this information, we can assess how many electrodes in a culture well detect functional spiking activity, giving an estimate of the coverage across the electrode array. The coverage is important to ensure that we are sampling from enough neurons to be confident in assessing the network phenotype. Second, excitable neurons may fire multiple action potentials in a short period, which is called a burst. There are, established, there are established algorithms in the field of neurophysiology that can detect and quantify burst behavior. Once a burst is detected, many features about the burst can be used to characterize the network activity, such as the frequency and duration of the burst or how many spikes are in each burst on average. These features describe the burst morphology, whereas we can also compute measures of burst organization such as how rhythmic or regular the bursts are in time. Finally, as synaptic, uh, functional synaptic connections develop between neurons in a population, bursting may be associated with synchronized activity across the network. Synchrony may be used to interpret network connectivity and is characterized by coincident spiking activity across multiple electrodes in the array. We need a way to organize network spiking activity across space and time to visualize and then quantify these features of the network phenotype, namely the functionality, excitability, and connectivity that we just discussed. Throughout this presentation, I will organize the signals from a single culture well into a raster plot. If we focus on the raw voltage signal acquired from a single electrode, indicated here on the left, we can uh, indicate each action potential uh, detected by a single tick mark. 
So as an algorithm operates on this voltage signal and detects action potentials, each of the vertical lines below indicates the exact timing of that action potential. This series of tick marks describes the timing of action potentials on a single electrode, and then a raster plot stacks these tick marks from each electrode such that the periods of increased activity or coincident spiking can be readily visualized. Here, the tick marks uh, labeled in blue are bursts of action potentials, so they've been detected and identified as a burst according to automated algorithms. And the magenta boxes outline areas of synchrony and network bursting, where again, automated algorithms have detected the coincident spiking across electrodes within the well. For this study, we used the recently released Maestro Pro Multi-Well MEA platform from Axion Biosystems. The Maestro Pro accepts Axion MEA plates with 12, 48, or 96 wells of various types, including our classic plates or side of view plates, the latter of which are transparent for cell imaging. There are 768 electrodes distributed across the wells in each plate, and all 768 electrodes are sampled simultaneously at 12.5 kilohertz by the Maestro Pro. The Maestro Edge was also introduced recently and accepts 24 well plates with 384 electrodes. Aside from the well and electrode counts, the Maestro Pro and Edge have identical features, which I'll briefly touch on now. The BioCore V4 processor is the interface between the biology and the electronics, as it is responsible for all signal acquisition by the Maestro Pro and Edge. The V4 chip provides stronger signals, wider frequency content, and significant flexibility as compared to the previous iteration in the Maestro. Each Maestro Pro has 12 cores, while the Maestro Edge has six cores. The Maestro Pro and Edge also include integrated environmental controls, which is critically important for a successful assay, as the cells are a product of their environment. A single 100% CO2 input is required on the back panel, and then the internal gas, gas mixer of the device delivers 5% CO2 to the plate chamber using a 360-degree shower design to evenly distribute the, the gas across the chamber. The MEA plate itself rests on a heater plate, uh, heating from the bottom, while the ITO coating on the glass chamber door allows it to, to heat the plate from the, above as well. Finally, the Maestro Pro and Edge have been designed with a one-button setup in mind. Pressing the button automatically operates the motorized plate chamber to securely dock the plate, adjust the CO2 and temperature to optimize the cell environment, and scans the plate barcode to configure software and file handling. This is one example of how we have designed the Maestro Pro and Edge to make electrophysiology intuitive and accessible. And as the data is sampled by the electronics, the Access Navigator software acquires, stores, and processes the data in real time. Here we see the raw voltage signals being detected on each of the 16 electrodes in this well on a 48 well plate. Spike detection algorithms operate in real time to extract the extracellular action potentials displayed here in a separate window. In addition, the spikes are organized into a real-time raster plot. And finally, the activity map represents uh, the spiking activity occur occurring across the entire plate in a single viewing window, with each flash of color indicating a synchronized network spiking event. In addition to Access Navigator, which processes, analyzes, and saves the data, there are complementary offline tools that allow the user to perform additional analyses in the neural metric tool and that's including uh, parameters for customizing burst and synchrony uh, algorithms for detection and computation of results, or the access metric plotting tool, uh, which is used to compile data across an experiment and generate publication-ready figures. So now that we've gone over the cells and platform used for this study, uh, as well as the uh, B27 Plus uh, neuronal culture system and the motivations for the study, I'd like to quickly go over some of the study uh, details and experimental protocol. So we used three side of view MEA 48 well plates. Um, these plates here were coated with poly D lysine uh, to generate a surface that the cells would uh, adhere to well. The cells in particular were the primary rodent cortical neurons, um, and they were seeded at two different densities, 80,000 and 160,000 cells per well, with N, N equals six per condition per plate. Uh, those conditions were the B27 catalog media, and the B27 plus, B27 catalog with uh, serum, 
and then uh, supplier BP, which is a commercial media from another vendor. Cells were maintained for 35 days in vitro with hack media changes every two to three days. So that was on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. The recordings were then acquired 24 hours after the media changes, so a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule, and then analyzed using Access Navigator. For this, uh, all of the data that I'll show here in the subsequent slides, uh, we focused on the 80,000 cells per well. Uh, indeed, it was, um, uh, as we'll see, um, more than sufficient number of cells and cell density uh, in order to characterize the activity from these various uh, media types. And that's what we'll do here. So on the left, I'm showing an activity map, a static uh, representation of the activity map, um, which is averaging over long periods of time the activity on each electrode within a well across the uh, various conditions on the plate. So again, each of these uh, conditions we're looking at is an 80,000 cells per well with the B27 plus catalog on the left, the B27 plus um, in the middle, and the supplier BP on the right. Uh, and within this activity map, the first thing that's striking is the uh, greater coverage overall with the B27 plus, where we're getting 15 or 16 uh, out of 16 electrodes in every well within that condition, uh, and then often much less and at lower spiking intensity in the B27 and supplier BP wells. And we can look at this uh, information from a different perspective, and that's how the, the spiking activity is organized across space and time within a well using the raster plot that we discussed earlier. So the raster plot on the top for the B27 supplement and neuronal media, the catalog product, uh, you'll notice that there's um, coverage on about half of the electrodes, uh, a significant amount of spontaneous firing across uh, a select few neurons within the well. And only very rarely are there spontaneous network events um, uh, indicated by the orange boxes. Um, and with the four across this 60 second recording, uh, they're happening very infrequently and with much lower intensity. Then by comparison, the B27 plus neuronal culture system, uh, which is shown in the middle, where we're getting very regular, extremely high intensity network bursting events. And these again are shown by the orange boxes uh, outlining the raster plots, demarcating the beginning and the end of each burst, as well as the histogram that's shown on top of the raster plot. Finally, the supplier BP um, um, uh, raster plot at the bottom shows that it had an, a phenotype somewhere in between the B27 catalog and the B27 plus neuronal culture system. And with the supplier BP um, raster plot showing a mix of uh, spontaneous activity, small uh, but relatively frequent network events, uh, network spiking events, um, and then even a, a, a brief transition into desynchronized activity towards the end of the recording. Uh, uh, raster plot over on the right. If we animate um, the activity map, we can actually see what this looks like in real time. So with each burst of color uh, in that center column indicating one of these extremely large bursts on the B27 neuronal culture, uh, B27 plus neuronal culture system. The activity on the uh, left and right by comparison are showing small, um, relatively infrequent network events. So if we begin to quantify this using Axis Navigator and the Neural Metric Tool, um, I'll go through three metrics that represent some of the key features that we discussed earlier regarding um, functionality, excitability, and connectivity. Uh, the first is the active electrode coverage, or the number of uh, electrodes in a well that are covered by uh, a cell. And this is uh, critically important because a reliable assessment of the network electrophysiology requires measurements from many neurons within a network. To, do, uh, to cal calculate this information, we uh, um, defined a minimum threshold of spiking activity where above that mean firing rate, an electrode was determined an active electrode. So out of 16 electrodes per well, we find that the active electrodes for B27 plus uh, wells achieved near perfect coverage uh, shortly after functional activity emerged. So with activity emerging around day seven uh, and 10 in vitro, um, the full coverage across uh, over 15 active electrodes per well was achieved by the B27 plus by day 15 in culture. Um, by comparison, the B27 catalog product um, took much longer to reach full coverage uh, around day 19 uh, and then dropped precipitously after that. The supplier BP wells 
um, showed a similarly early rise in active electrode coverage, um, but then uh, decreased over time and it ultimately settled around 10 to, uh, 10 to 12 active electrodes per well. So the B27 Plus uh, system, shown in orange, exhibited the greatest electrode coverage of all media tested, with coverage stable across many days in culture. The next uh, that I'd like to focus on is excitability or functionality. Um, this is measured by the mean firing rate of the cells. Um, so in this case, uh, this, this is defined by the total number of action potentials detected per second for the mean firing rate. Um, and what we found was that neural activity steadily increased for networks cultured in B27 plus before stabilizing at approximately 30 days in vitro. And when we look at the plot uh, over on the right, quantitatively, you can see that you achieved about three times as much uh, activity uh, insofar as mean firing rate for the B27 plus wells as compared to uh, the B27 catalog or the supplier BP. And again, uh, important to note, as we'll discuss a little bit further on, um, that fairly stable mean firing rate between days 26 to day 35. So in summary here, the B27 Plus system in orange promoted a higher degree of firing activity as the network matured uh, and as quantified via the mean firing rate. Finally, um, synchronized network activity, uh, which is arises from strong and numerous synaptic connections between neurons within a mature network, uh, was quantified using the synchrony index. Um, and this was a metric that's uh, computed automatically in the neural metric tool and was modified from PIVA et al. 2010. So what we show here in the plot on the right is that this network at maturation, uh, as measured by the synchrony index, um, peaks uh, and then stabilizes around day 15 in culture, very shortly after functional activity emerges. Um, again, this is in com comparison with B27 uh, catalog product, uh, which shows relatively low values for synchrony index, consistent with the desynchronized activity we observed in the raster plots earlier on in the slide presentation and then the supplier BP wells, which showed an initial increase in synchrony, um, but then as the activity uh, matured and the network matured over time, um, uh, approached uh, intermediate value of synchrony index. That's the B27 plus system uh, shown in orange facilitated stronger network development as evidenced by the high degree of synchrony relative to other media systems. To summarize this first portion of the talk, um, uh, particularly around the maturation of uh, rodent cortical uh, activity in the B27 plus system. Um, the B27 plus culture system supported high active electrode coverage, such that the required cell density may be reduced for more, more cost efficient assay. So as I mentioned before, these studies were um, performed at two different cell densities, um, and the cell density at 80,000 cells per well performed exceptionally well with the B27 plus culture system suggesting that potentially fewer cells could be used for well um, in implementation of a rodent cortical neuron assay. The other thing that's important to highlight about the high active electric coverage um, is the uh, feasibility of um, moving this assay to a 96 volt plate, uh, which the 96 volt plates um, from Axion have eight electrodes per well, um, such that if uh, uh, perfect act active electrode coverage is being achieved, as was uh, observed here with the B27 plus culture system. Um, we guarantee or have eight electrodes per well, which would be sufficient for performing uh, various neurophysiological assays. Second, um, the electrophysiological phenotype uh, is characterized by high spontaneous firing rates and strong synchrony, suggesting mature synaptic connections are made throughout the functional network consistent with a lot of the structural work um, uh, that and structural results that have been demonstrated by Thermo Fisher. Coverage, excitability, and connectivity were stable over a large assay window as well, with coverage and connectivity um, peaking around day 15 in vitro and being fairly stable um, from day 15 to day 35, whereas the mean firing rate um, uh, reached stability around day 26 to day 35 again, providing uh, significant experimental flexibility after network maturity is reached. In the second half of the study, I'm going to go over some pharmacological results. Um, so this is using these same plates. So you recall we had 80,000 cells per well um, uh, across four media conditions, B27 catalog, B27 plus, B27 with serum, and the supplier BP 
media formulation. We then dosed uh, with carbamazepine, DMSO, and picrotoxin across the plate as indicated in the plate map in the upper right, such that we got uh, two replicates per compound, per condition, per plate across each of the three plates. A sequential dosing scheme was used for each plate with five concentrations for each treatment condition. Uh, the DMSO at 0.1% was used for compound preparation and thus served as the vehicle control. A 30-minute recording was collected for baseline activity uh, and after each sequential dose, and the last 10 minutes of each recording was used to compute network activity endpoints. This is illustrated in the uh, bottom right corner of the slide, where again, with a sequential dose, increasing uh, concentrations of the compound were added to the same wells over time, such that the network activity phenotype was tracked across concentrations of a particular compound for the same well. Uh, and this was repeated for five sequential doses. Here I'm showing um, uh, across this slide a series of raster plots across that sequential dose. So the top raster plot um, indicates the baseline conditions so prior to dosing. And then each of the subsequent raster plots shows an increasing concentration of uh, the vehicle controls. Uh, in this case, DMSO uh, used at 0.1% for vehicle control, and then subsequently with each addition for the sequential dose, uh, up to 0.5% DMSO. Here, qualitatively on the left, we'll note that uh, the bursting activity is uh, unaffected. So I've roughly quantified the, the burst for 300 seconds. Um, which is shown here on the right of the raster plots, um, where there is 9, 9, 10, 7, 8, and 9 network bursts per 300 seconds. Uh, so this is a very rough quantification. Um, and then actually we can see in the plot in the lower right, the network burst frequency uh, percent change relative to baseline across the five doses, showing very little effect for the DMSO uh, vehicle control wells. Uh, and this is consistent what we observed qualitatively. Also, if you pay attention to the raster plot on the left, you'll note that the shape and size of the burst uh, does not change across the addition of the vehicle control. Um, and with the shape and size of the burst remaining unchanged uh, and the network burst frequency remaining unchanged, uh, by virtue of that, the mean firing rate is also unchanged, which is also shown in the top right portion of the plot. So in summary, the network phenotype was robust, displaying little change in response to addition of the vehicle control. On this slide, we're showing the results from picrotoxin, um, which is a, a proconvulsant reference compound often used for uh, characterization of proconvulsant effects in vitro. Uh, with a similar format, we're showing the raster plot for the baseline and then the raster plot for increasing concentrations of picrotoxin as you move down the slide. Uh, in this case, I've changed the scale, so we're looking at uh, a raster plot of 100 seconds of activity and quantifying the burst uh, uh, per 100 seconds just to the right of the raster plot. And immediately you'll notice that even at the lowest con uh, concentration of picrotoxin, 10 nanomolar, we're showing a significant increase in the network burst frequency, going from five bursts per 100 seconds to 15 bursts per 100 seconds. Uh, this continues to increase with increasing concentrations of picrotoxin until saturating at around 35 bursts per 100 seconds in the picrotoxin at 100 micromolar uh, concentration. Uh, this is quantified across wells in the plot on the lower right portion of the slide, where the network burst frequency again shows a dose-dependent increase um, in the uh, frequency uh, in response to picrotoxin. Again, similar with the previous slide, the actual um, morphology of the burst did not change significantly as far as the burst duration or number of spikes per burst, and as such, the network burst frequency was reflected um, by a change in the mean firing rate. So in summary, on this slide, picrotoxin increased network burst frequency and rhythmicity, which, among other metrics, indicates pro-convulsant risk. Finally, carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic drug that's been on the market for uh, um, many years, decreased and eliminated the network phenotype. So using the same slide format as before, we have the baseline raster plot uh, at the top with increasing concentrations of carbamazepine um, going down the slide. Again, in this case, we're zoomed out to where the raster plot represents 300 seconds of activity uh, with quantified of 10, 10, 10, 5, 2, and 0 network burst per 300 seconds. 
um, such that even at uh, concentrations as low as 10 micromolar of carbamazepine, we're seeing a significant change in the network burst frequency um, by dropping from 10 to 5, uh, uh, moving from concentration 3 micromolar to 10 micromolar. Beyond just changes in network burst frequency, we saw changes in um, uh, network burst organization uh, as well. And that's shown in the top right in the burst irregularity. This is a measure of how rhythmic uh, the bursts are occurring in time, which in baseline are occurring uh, roughly every 30 seconds with uh, very little jitter um, in that inner burst interval. Whereas as you add more and more carbamazepine, uh, starting to observe this at the third concentration, 10 micromolar, you get a significant variability in that interburst interval, uh, which when quantified as burst irregularity, showed a significant change in dose three and dose four, and then ultimately a decrease in dose five due to the elimination of network bursting in the majority of wells. Consistent with this elimination of network bursting, we quantified the percentage of spikes uh, that occurred within network bursts and the percentage change from baseline through the dose conditions. For carbamazepine, we saw a significant reduction um, in the number of uh, network bursts at um, uh, 10 micromolar carbamazepine while the spontaneous activity between the bursts was largely retained. And this ultimately uh, uh, leads to a reduction in the percentage of spikes in network bursts while the mean firing rate doesn't change significantly. So in summary here, carbamazepine decreased network burst frequency and mean firing rate overall, consistent with results from other anti-epileptic drugs. In summary here for the pharmacology results in general, the network activity phenotype responded with opposite and expected trends for carbamazepine, an anti-epileptic drug, and picrotoxin, a known proconvulsant reference compound. The responses to each compound also deviated from the vehicle control response which was stable relative to the baseline activity. Endpoints related to functionality, excitability, and connectivity were all sensitive to the known reference compounds. In summary for the talk, microelectrode array uh, assays provide a functional measure of network electrophysiology for applications in drug discovery, safety and toxicology, and disease and addition modeling. Key aspects of assay sensitivity and reproducibility are determined throughout network maturation, which is influenced significantly by the, the culture system during development. The B27 Plus network phenotype produced the highest electrode coverage, highest mean firing rate, and the highest network synchrony as compared to other commonly used commercial culture systems. The B27 Plus network phenotype was sensitive to perturbations uh, with an anti-epileptic and proconvulsant reference compounds. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge some of the team members at Axion and Thermo Fisher that were critical to the work, uh, in particular at Anthony Nicolini and Colin Arrowood, who helped perform the majority of the experiments, Heather Hayes for her assistance in data analysis, and Mike Clements and Jim Ross for their direction. Uh, additionally, at Thermo Fisher Scientific, um, Michael Durr, Hunter Tuck, Melissa Stewart, and David Kuninger, with special uh, um, um, reference to Michael Durr, who helped with uh, uh, implementation analysis and interpretation of the data. Thank you, and I'd like to open it to any questions. Presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. I'd also like to draw your attention to a link popped up on your screen now. Here you can learn more about Maestro Pro and Maestro Edge that might not be answered during the Q&A. So let's take a look at our questions from our audience members now and welcome audience again to this live Q&A portion. Our first question for you, doctor, is which measure of the neural network phenotype is most useful across application areas? Uh, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, I'll start, uh, I guess, in a couple of different aspects. Um, first is that there are multiple portions of the network phenotype that provide very specific information, the, the three of which that we focused on during the talk were 
functionality, excitability, and connectivity. So for instance, um, just the, the mere fact that the neurons are, are active and the uh, action potentials are being detected by the electrode provides some information on the functionality where those uh, neurons are actually functionally active. Uh, and then finally, synchrony provides, uh, of course, some input as to whether the cells are networked together, such that when one action potential uh, is transmitted from one neuron to another, um, that, that second neuron is activated within the network. Now, beyond uh, pr the metrics providing very specific uh, information about certain aspects of the culture and the maturation, uh, we found that for much of our internal work, um, aspects of the network bursting or synchrony um, um, phenotype are the most predictive, um, and that's generally for compound dosing and compound evaluation. Um, in particular, network burst duration or network burst frequency uh, are extremely sensitive to the interplay of excitation and inhibition within the network, uh, such that if uh, a compound perturbs that balance and shifts it to one end or the other, uh, there's very clear and uh, readily understood um, uh, changes in the network burst duration, either getting longer or shorter, or vice versa, the network burst frequency becoming uh, higher or lower, um, that uh, makes sense from a mechanistic uh, understanding of how that should work with the uh, excitation inhibition. Uh, last thing I'll mention there is that um, the multiple parameters of uh, the network phenotype are particularly useful um, in other areas of disease in a dish modeling, where you're trying to recreate a disease phenotype in a dish, um, such that when that genetic mutation or other introduction of the disease phenotype uh, is made, there are a number of different uh, aspects of the phenotype that can be used to characterize and determine uh, a fingerprint, if you will, of how that disease phenotype uh, manifests uh, for a particular network. Thank you. And Dr. Miller, was there any media changes that occurred during the culture period for B27 and B27 plus and supplier BP? And if so, how often? Yeah, so the media changes were done on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, so three media changes per week. Um, with, with no weekend work involved, and the uh, cultures were carried out in those uh, three media conditions uh, throughout the entirety of the culture maturation. So B27 catalog wells received only B27 throughout the duration of, of the study, uh, and vice versa for the B27 plus and supplier BP. Thank you. Our next question is, does B27 plus need to be used during the entire maturation period to achieve the neural network phenotype described in your presentation? Yeah, that's a good follow-up question to the last question in that um, uh, the, I guess another way of asking the question would have been, what would have happened if we had switched um, from B27 catalog to B27 plus at day 21 in vitro? Um, and we have performed some very preliminary experiments in this regard, uh, and the answer is that uh, B27 plus is needed during the entire maturation period. Um, this, uh, and I think intuitively this makes sense that the network maturation is a dynamic process that over occurs over a long period of time in culture, and it's very dependent on the activity and health of the cells during that time. Uh, and so if once that maturation uh, and synaptic connections, once those have been formed, um, the, there's little that you can uh, kind of undo uh, aside from simply changing the ionic balances in the media. So um, again, that with very preliminary uh, results, the answer is yes, you need the B27 plus throughout the duration of the experiment. Thank you, Dr. Millard, and thank you to our audience members. We have some excellent questions coming in. Our next question, your data showed cells in B27 plus having more activities than the other two media. But which one was closer to activities in vivo? I'm sorry, it probably means in vitro. In vitro. Uh, no, I, well, I, I'm guessing the in vivo, and um, it's an interesting question. So these were rodent cortical neurons. Um, so actually my background um, previously in graduate school was uh, with um, in vivo recordings in uh, cortical and thalamic neurons. Um, and cortical neurons in a rodent, in an awake-behaving rodent, are approximately 10 hertz. Um, so what we saw with the um, B27 plus media, which I'll, I'll switch over to now, uh, was about 10 hertz firing rate across the network. Um, so I think as far as what is most consistent uh, with in vivo, um, uh, as far as just general excitability, I think the B27 plus 
uh, is most similar? Thank you. And how do the environmental control variables like temperature and CO2 affect the neural network phenotype? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so the environmental controls uh, uh, with neurons uh, can be uh, very important, in particular temperature. Um, so increases in temperature uh, generally lead to, and this is uh, across our experience with uh, multiple cell types and multi multiple media types, generally leads to faster and shorter network burst events, uh, whereas decreased temperature has the opposite effect, so longer bursts uh, and uh, much less frequent bursts. Um, these temperature changes or responses to, uh, changes in response to temperature um, take about five minutes to settle and stabilize, uh, stabilize out, um, whereas it can take longer to re-equilibrate to proper pH um, via uh, CO2 equilibration. So that's longer on the 15-minute time frame. Thank you very much. And here's our next question. Is stimulation available on the Maestro Pro and Maestro Edge? And if so, how does this enhance in vitro neural assays? Um, yeah, so stimulation is definitely available on the Maestro Pro and Edge in a couple of different formats. Uh, the first uh, via electrical stimulation from any one of the 768 electrodes uh, on a plate, actually an MEA plate. Um, uh, and that's in uh, any combination across those electrodes. So each electrode has its own independent stimulator. Um, and then also separately with optogenetics um, uh, via the LUMOS, which is a, a multi-well optogenetic stimulator uh, that interfaces directly with the Maestro Pro. Um, so as far as how can stimulation enhance the assay, uh, I think there's a, a, a really three key areas, uh, in my opinion. The first is uh, reliability and sensitivity of the assay. So by stimulating each well, uh, you can control uh, the firing of each well such that uh, the network burst events are happening at the same frequency. Uh, and that's going to help to reduce well-to-well -well variability and allow you to focus on v other var variables or parameters such as the network burst duration when the network burst frequency is held constant. Uh, the second is access to additional endpoints with metrics of evoked activity. Um, so there's additional metrics that can be computed um, in response to uh, a, a stimulation event um, that would complement some of the metrics that we talked about uh, in the webinar today. And then finally is the idea of a targeted assay, uh, whereby you might have a specific mechanism uh, of interest that um, uh, due to a disease phenotype or a compound that you're evaluating, and it's possible to design stimulation uh, protocols that specifically target that mechanism, whether it's a mechanism related to adaptation uh, or frequency-specific uh, ion channel block. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Our next question, does having a higher mean fire rate and higher synchrony have advantages for interpreting compound treatment conditions? Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's another good question. So um, for interpreting compound uh, treatment conditions, I would say the first and foremost uh, is that you want to have reliable activity across wells. Um, and in particular, a reliable response uh, to the DMSO. Um, so I'll quickly jump over to our uh, DMSO slide here, just uh, have it in the background while I'm talking. But to have a very stable response to the vehicle control that's used to deliver compounds um, is really important and able to be able to resolve any differences or changes that might occur with compound addition. Um, and as far as um, uh, having a, a good degree of synchrony, it's important to have synchrony such that uh, then if you're adding a compound that is going to affect or reduce that synchrony, uh, you'd be able to uh, detect that or uh, uh, resolve that difference. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And how different ECM coatings and ECM embedding affect the fire, firing uh, frequency? Let me say that again. Um, oh, did you get that? Okay. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's interesting. I, if, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, um, we typically use, um, uh, in this case, we used uh, poly D lysine as far as a, a coating on the plates in order to help encourage the cells to attach and grow. Um, and then we've also used in the past uh, PEI 
uh, to uh, facilitate the attachment of the neurons. And really what we found is that the attachment is, is critical to keep the neurons uh, in place and keep them from clumping. Uh, but once the neurons are there, their activity is uh, uh, not significantly affected. Um, if, if the question is about um, uh, 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 something more detailed as far as actual extracellular matrix um, proteins, um, please feel free to uh, reach out to me via email, and I'd be happy to try and answer the question uh, uh, in more detail uh, with a little bit more information. Thank you, Dr. Larden. Thank you again, audience members. Here's our next question. What's the difference between B27 and B27 plus, and it's a two-part question, is there anything added to the B27 plus that improves its activity? Yeah, so I, I'm unfortunately probably not the most qualified person to answer um, exactly what is different between uh, the, the actual components within B27 and B27 plus. I'd encourage um, uh, you to r reach out to representatives at Thermo Fisher, and in fact, if you reach out to me, I'd be happy to put you in contact with them. Uh, my understanding of the B27 plus uh, is that it is a, an optimized uh, formulation of, of B27. So it's many of the same uh, components, and really um, uh, it was uh, an optimized formulation with no added small molecules or growth factors. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Is standard error or standard deviation shown on the graph? Yeah, so that, that, that's a good question. The graphs all use standard error for the uh, error bars um, throughout the presentation. And that was that varying number of replicates, I think, was um, described throughout the presentation. But early on in the study, um, or the presentation where I'm showing maturation metrics, um, that's across um, sin six uh, replicates per plate per condition. Um, but then towards the end with the dosing results, uh, there's many fewer replicates as we uh, use those same six replicates per plate and split it across three compounds. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for your presentation. And thank you, audience members, for your live participation. Dr. Miller, did you want to provide the audience with any closing remarks? Um, no, thank you all for your um, uh, attention and participation in the question and answer. Um, uh, it really was a pleasure, pleasure to share some of the results that we were able to um, uh, achieve with the B27 Plus media using the Maestro Pro system. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to me um, uh, via email. Uh, my email address is included in the Labroots profile um, or uh, reach out to us through the Axion Biosystems website if you have any additional questions. Thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Millard. And I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.